continues the Gemara's discussion about establishing the fact that a, that a woman's husband had died and you can allow her to remarry. We have one Mishnah, the first part of the daf, until the Mishnah concludes the discussion about what is Pshad and Abelazar's opinion that a woman's tzara is potentially believed in certain circumstances. Gemara wants to know why he holds that way and in Afkamina and two proofs. Now we get to the Mishnah, which discusses two aspects where the issue is not believability. We don't think the person's lying, but we want to make sure, first of all, that he identified the person correctly, and second of all, that he knows that he died for sure. He didn't just make a mistake and assume that a severe wound is going to kill the person. So we'll have to figure out how we can establish identity. The more we'll get into the concept of simonim, when you see a certain indicating sign, which you didn't recognize the person. When does that count? Our Simon and Dereiser de Rabbanan, and as it compared to identifying a lost object. And then we'll get into a wound, which wounds are a certain testament to the death of the person, which are not. So let's begin. We've seen the Gemara holds that although the Rabbanan say that a woman's tsara, her co wife, cannot, cannot testify to the death of her husband, she's not believed. We were afraid she's trying to mess her up. She doesn't like her because she's her co wife. They are competitors, and therefore she wants to mess her up. And put her in a situation where she'll remarry, although she's not allowed to. So though the Rabbanon hold away, Rabbi Lazar says, if the co-wife who's testifying, she herself remarried and did yibum, in fact, based on her own testimony, so if she went so far, then we'll assume that she is telling the truth. So the Gemara says, what is Pshat in Rabbi Lazar? Why does he say that we assume that the Tzara is telling the truth? Is it because he holds across the board that Tzara is believed? It doesn't hold to the concept that the Tzara is not believed? Or is it only if she remarried? So the Gemara says, what's an Afkamina? Either way, she's believed in this case. And says, yeah, the difference would be if she never actually remarried. What if she just came and she testified and she herself didn't remarry? Would we allow her, would we allow the co-wife to remarry based on the testimony? Or would she, or or do we require her to show that she believes her own testimony and go and remarry herself. So the Gemara has two proofs. The Gemara says, first of all, our Mishnah, we just quoted, says clearly that because she did Yibum, it seems to indicate, because she did Yibum, that's why the Tzara is allowed to remarry. But otherwise, you would not trust the testimony of a Tzara. So the Gemara says, that's not a proof. It could be that Rabbi Lezer was just answering the Chachamim. The Chachamim said, in this case, the Tzara is not allowed to remarry. Rabbi Lezer said, look, I hold that a Tzara is believed. You disagree, fine, but at least agree to me in this case. She went and actually did Yibum. She put herself in a situation of an Israelitis. Ah, a car race. Certainly she didn't do that just to mess up someone that she doesn't like. You should at least agree to me in this scenario. But it doesn't prove that that's what Rebbe Lezer requires. It could be that he himself would allow it, even if it was just a Tzara who testified without showing that she herself was willing to act based on the testimony and get remarried. Which is okay, I have another proof. And that's where you have a woman whose husband went to Medina Siyam. She came back and she said that he died. So the Bryce there says, so she can remarry and she can take her ksuba, but her tsar is forbidden, according to the Chachamim. Rabbi Lazar says, because she is permitted, her tsara is permitted as well. So you see that it's because she is permitted, not because she actually went and got remarried. Mercer says, this is not a proof. It could be that the situation over here is where she went and she got remarried. It says she is permitted, we mean because she's permitted and she remarries. So the Gemara says, but if Rabbi Lazar here is depending on the fact that she went and she got remarried, so here she didn't get remarried. It doesn't say here that she did Yibum. It just says that she got remarried. So what's the proof? Maybe she got a get from her husband in Medina Siam. He's alive and well. And she has a divorce document. So she knows she's mutter to remarry. So she'll remarry herself. But she doesn't forgive her tsar to remarry. Her tsar is not allowed to remarry, in fact. But she wants to mess her up. So she says, uh, her husband, he died. And that way she herself is not doing anything wrong. She has a get. But the tsar, she messed her up. When her husband will come back, the tsar will be um, in a terrible situation of having married a second man while she was married to the first man. So Gemara says... You're right, that would be a valid concern if she marries a Yisrael. If she marries a Kohen, then you can't have that uh, concern because if the husband will come back, she's going to have to take out her get to prove that she's really remarried. And then if she's married to a Kohen, she's going to leave him. Okay, now in all these scenarios, what are their abundant and hold? How come they say that it's not a proof that she went and she got remarried? So the Muslims, their abundant say that she is acting like 
Shimshin, who was willing to die himself in order to take the Pelishtim down with him. She was willing to mess herself up just in order to mess up her husband, her co-wife as well. There is such a concept. Okay, now we begin the Mishnah. The Mishnah discusses, first of all, how you identify a person who died, make sure you're talking about the right person, and second of all, how do you know that he really did die? So the Mishnah says as follows, you need to see the man's face, including the nose. If you didn't see the nose, then you cannot identify him based on a face without a nose. You have to see the face. The Gemara explains that is the entire face and includes the lower part of the face and the upper part of the face, the forehead. All of that is included, as well as the nose itself. Says the Mishnah further, if you have simonim on the rest of the body, you saw some indicating mark on the rest of the body or on his clothing, that's not valid. A testimony does not prove that this is a person you think he is. Now, how do you know that he died? So you have to actually see the death. You cannot assume based on a serious wound that he's going to die for sure. Even if you saw him chopped up, not literally chopped up, but being hacked, that is suffering a cut or a sword wound, which seems extremely severe, that's not enough evidence. If you saw him hanging on a hangman's noose or a crucifix, that doesn't count either. Even if you see a wild animal eating from him, that is also not a proof that he died. You have to actually see the death of the individual. Now, you may not recognize the person if it's far enough after the death because the body blows up, it changes, and therefore it's got to be within three days of the death, um, according to the Chachamim. And here you have Rav Yehuda ben Bava who says that it depends on the person, on the place, and the time. Some uh, times you have a situation where the body will decompose faster or slower. And we're on the next half, we'll explain what is his argument, is he, which side is he uh, advocating for. Okay, the Gemara begins, the Gemara says, when we said you have to see the entire face, you mean with the forehead as well. And we saw just the forehead or and the nose, or just the lower part of the face and the nose, but not the entire thing. You cannot testify based on that. Abai says you can learn that at a passing in Shai, where it says, Akaras Paneam Ansabam, you recognize them because of their entire face. And where brings the story, Abba Bar Marta, who was also known as Abba Bar Minyumi, owed money to the tax collectors of the Reish Galusa. He disguised himself by sticking a little bit of wax on a cloth and sticking the wax to his forehead, so it was hanging over his face. Couldn't see his face, and he walked right by the people who he owed the money to, and they were not able to identify him by anything uh, without his face there. Okay, Sex, the uh, Gemara says further, Simonim. We said that you cannot testify based on Simonim, based on signs. You've seen identifying marks in the body, the clothing of the individual. So the Gemara says there seems to be a contradictory statement that says you do uh, identify something based on Simanim, that's if a shliach brought a get and he lost it and that he found it tied to his possessions that he recognized based on his and It was tied to his kiss, that is his money bag or his wallet or his signet ring or between his clothing. Um, even if it's a long time later, he could assume that that is the get that he brought. So that's based on Simanim. And there you're going to give it to the woman and allow her to remarry. That's an Isidar Isid you're allowing. So how can you say that we don't allow her hus- we don't allow the woman to remarry based on Simanim or the death of her husband if you allow her to remarry based on Simanim that the get is really her get? So the Gemara answers, and Bahi says it's a machlokis. It's a machlokis whether you use Simanim or not. Our Mishnah is the opinion of the Rabbanon. Uh, who say that you cannot testify based on Simonim, and the other mission is the opinion of Rabbi Lazar ben Mahavai. Where do we see this Machokas? Machokas about a Shuma. If you see a person, you want to identify a corpse based on a mole, so the Chachamim say you cannot identify it based on that, and Rabbi Lazar ben Mahavai says you can. So that's what we're arguing over. Our mission holds like the Chachamim. So the Gemara says, so... What is, we have to first understand that machlokas, if you want to say that our Mishnah here is based on one of those two sides, you have to understand what that machlokas is. So Abai wants to say machlokas is whether simonim count, me their ice or not. Do you say that simonim are a good uh, indicator to establish halacha der So not, not necessarily is that shot in that machlokas over there. Could be that machlokas is about the nature of a mole. 
do moles, do you, do you find the same mole by multiple individuals, specifically somebody who's a Ben Gile, that is he's born under the same mazel as another individual, he has the same life to some extent, he has the same mazel happening to him, could he have a mole in the same spot, and therefore you don't know you're talking about the right individual just based on the moles. It's not a question in Simon, it's a question in moles. Another possibility, another way of understanding this machlokas is do moles change after the death of the person? Can you not use them to identify somebody who died because they could be that it changed and you thought you recognized it from the when the person was alive, really it was someone else and it changed to look like the person that you know when it was alive because moles change after the death. The third shot could be that everybody really agrees that simonim are no good Simonim only can't meet our banan, but there is something called a simon muvhok, and that's something which is a rare, hard to notice identifying thing. There's no way the two people have the same thing, and therefore this is more than actual simonim. So these are multiple ways of explaining that machlokas. So the Gemara therefore is asking is how can you assume that that machlokas would be a machlokas here as well? Maybe the machlokas is only over something like Shuma or something uh, like that, and it would not apply to our Mishnah, and therefore you wouldn't have an explanation, you wouldn't have a way of showing that there's a machlokas over our Mishnah. So the Gemara then answers that the Peshat would be as follows. Our Gemara that says, our Mishnah that says that you cannot identify the person based on Simonim is talking about where the simon was a very weak simon, it doesn't count as a simon at all. Like if he said it was a very tall person, a very short person, that that's not a good simon. And in the clothing, simonim don't count it as, at all because the clothing can be loaned from one person to another. And therefore, simon in clothing doesn't count. Um, so you can't identify based on that. So the word says, hold on a second. You're telling me that you're, you're concerned for something being loaned out. So then how come if you find a donkey wearing a saddle and you can identify the saddle, then you can assume that the donkey belongs to the saddle's owner. Maybe somebody lent the saddle to somebody else. Remember, says, no, people don't lend the saddle. Um, it's going to be the wrong size, and it's going to injure the skin of the donkey. That's not going to happen. So the Gemara says, uh, okay, what about the case where you said you found the get next to the person's wallet or his signet ring or his, why can't, why you, you should be concerned that those items were loaned as well, and therefore it's not the right get. Where says, no, nobody lends out their signet ring because someone can use it to forge his signature. And nobody lends out his wallet or his money bag because he's afraid that his mazel of his fortune, his finances, is going to go to someone else. Another shot in this entire discussion is that you cannot use identifying marks of clothing. That means we're also referring to where they're not properly identifying. All he said was the color. He said it was right, it was white, or it was red. Also not identifying Enough, it doesn't count as Simon at all. All right, now then we goes to the next figure where we saw if the uh, p- person is wounded, serious wound, you cannot assume that he's going to die for sure. So the Gemara says, uh, you mean to tell me that a wound is not a proof of a death of a kash? And that is a price that says that a person who is meguya, that's the term that's used here, is not mitame, he doesn't cause any tumor until his soul actually departs. But if he's just meguya, or even if he's a stage called Roy says that he's he's already in the final throes of the death, but he's not actually died yet, is not Matame yet. So the fact that we're saying that he's not Matame means it's certainly going to die, but until he actually dies, that's when the Tuma begins. But if he's not for sure going to die, we can't have a discussion if he's Matame or not. I mean, he's not even for sure going to die. So... Therefore, we seem to have this verse that seems to indicate that Muguyad is for sure going to die. So, the Gemara answers on Akasha. This is Abai says. It's a Machlaikis. The Shimon ben Elazar and the Rabbanon who argue whether a Muguyad, whether a serious wound, counts as a proof that he's going to die for sure or not. So, the Gemara brings the Brisa. The Brisa says if you have a person who is Muguyad or he is hanging from a rope, the Shimon ben Elazar says you cannot testify that he die for sure, because it could be healed by heat, and the Chavim say uh, he is going to, it, he's for sure going to die, and therefore you could testify. So our Mishnah then has to be Rav Shimon ben Elazar, who says that he could possibly be healed. Asks the Gemara, it can't be Rav Shimon ben Elazar, because if you look at the next Mishnah, which is really the conclusion of our Mishnah, this is a Mishnah coming up on the next staff, 
So there it says there was an incident that happened with a person in Asia who was lowered into the water and his leg got severed and all they got back from him was his leg. So over there, the Chachamim said, um, this is who the author of the uh, Mishnah is, that it depends where the severing was. If it was above the knee, the person certainly died from the wound. If it was below the knee, he could have survived and come out of the water somewhere else. So if you were holding like a Shimon ben Elazar, and you want to say that our mission is Rishim ben Elazar, and he holds that a, a person could survive a serious wound, so then how come if the leg is severed above the knee, you have to assume that he died? You can assume that he died, but Rishim ben Elazar holds that you could survive a serious wound. So the Gemara says, no, this is different because it's in the water. The water aggravates and prevents the clotting, and therefore he would not be able to survive a serious wound like that. Says the Gemara, I have another uh, question on the idea that a person can heal from a serious wound. The Gemara says, Rabbi Barbachana says, I saw an Arab took a sword and chopped off the leg of his camel above the knee, and the camel did not even finish its noise, the howl that it makes, and it died right away on the spot. So you see, Immediately, I can possibly tell me that a person can heal from that. So Gemara says that was different. That was a very weak camel. That was a unique. That was a one-time incident. You can't bring a proof based on one incident that happened. Could have been a circumstantial event that that camel died so fast. The Gemara goes back to the contradiction between the two Mishnayos as to whether you can survive a uh, deadly wound or not. The Gemara says that the case where the um, person survived, that was a heated knife. Um, where we're concerned that he survived, that was a heated knife. A heated knife clots quickly and therefore heals faster. All right, now the Gemara goes back to the Mishnah. The Mishnah said that if we see the uh, person being eaten by a wild animal, it's not proof that he died. The Gemara says, or who's the name of Shmuel? That's only if it's eating from a part of the body that, that, that does not contain the soul. However, if it's eating from something significant, such as if it's eating the person's neck, for example, then that would not, he obviously could testify that he died for sure. There's no way to escape that. Says the Gemara, a related thing of Yehuda said in the name of Shmuel, if someone shechts a person, he slaughters the two simonim, the esophagus and the trachea, and the person got up and ran away, you can still say that he is dead for sure and his wife is allowed to remarry. Says the Gemara, that seems to imply that anyone who's shecht is considered to be halachically slaughtered, even if he's running around. So if he's considered to be dead for sure halachically, he shouldn't be able to give a get. Yet we have a case. We have a uh, statement of Rabbi Huna in the name of Shmuel who says that if the person then indicated, wasn't to speak, but he indicated to two others and said, right, a get for my wife, they're allowed to do that. And that's a valid get, and she's considered divorced, not a widow. But you're telling me that he's considered to be, that he died. Someone says, no, I'm not saying that he died. The person who was slaughtered, who had his two simonim cut, is not considered to be dead. Dead halachically. What he is, is though, is going to die for sure. So therefore, you can allow his wife to remarry. Says a question on that. If he's going to die for sure based on that wound, then if somebody did that by accident, the person should be considered an accidental murderer and he has to go to Kralos to exile. We say that's not halachal. We have a bicep that says that if a person accidentally So the Gemara says, no, that's, that's different because it could have been something else that caused, contributed to the death of the person. It could be the wind, or it could be his uh, squirming around, his vibrating. So there's something that contributed to it. In a case where there's another contributing factor, the person who did the accident doesn't have to go to Gullis. However, something is going to cause the death. Ultimately, he's going to die. I'm sure that's not an issue. Between whether he, you're concerned about the wind or you're concerned about the writhing of the individual, the more says the difference is in a case where you had one and not the other. If you had a marble house and the wind can't get through, then the uh, victim was writhing around, then it depends if you say it's based on writhings, then you do have that concern. If you say it's based on the wind, you do not. Or you have a case where it's outside and the person didn't squirm, so then you could only say that uh, if the issue is because of the wind, then you can only say that it's not the person's fault necessarily fully, and you wouldn't send them to Gullus, but not if you held that it was because of the writhing.